Well, good afternoon and welcome back to this week's Table Talk. This week we are in Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. It is unit 6, and I want to remind you all that it is on page 64 of your book, which there are still some books available. We're going to be in this uh, this study now, parts 2, 3, and 4, uh, for 12 months. So we'd love for you to follow along. Just uh, grab a book at the Resource Center. And let's get on to Table Talk. And uh, this week we've got Mike going with us. Welcome, Mike. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's really good to have you here. You and your wife, Ann, have led a small group now for many years, mm-hmm. uh, very faithfully, and so thank you for that. But also, and we were talking before we got going here, you're part of the rapid response team for Billy Graham mm-hmm. uh, evangelism? or Correct. Uh, the, uh, the rapid response team for Billy Graham, uh, they deploy alongside Samaritan's Purse whenever yeah. there's a disaster or catastrophe and uh, minister to the volunteers and minister wow. to homeowners. Wow, what a blessing. And you're a chaplain I with am. them. Yeah, well, good. Well, well, thanks so much for taking time to join us today. Thanks for what you do. And Pastor Andrew, this is your, your, first, uh, your first time to pull up to the uh, season three of That's Table right. Talk. Glad to be here. Yeah, good to have you here with your message yesterday on this particular passage, and we appreciate that. Uh, and so let's let's just dig in. And what we like to, we've been doing here in season three. What we like to do is just begin with aha moments uh, for Andrew or the or the, whoever was pe- uh, preaching. Uh, was there anything in sermon prep? But also, as we sat under that teaching or we looked at the passage ourselves, is there anything that maybe we hadn't thought about before? Mike, I'd ask you that first. Uh, well, when I was thinking about this. These two stories recorded by Luke, uh, I couldn't help but be reminded of the song by the late Tom Petty, okay. I Won't Back Down. Uh. And this is, this is kind of how I picture Jesus with the Pharisees. Okay. Um, you know, I imagine the Pharisees watched him closely, and Andrew made the comment yesterday that the Greek word watch uh, is more closely resembling scrutinize. And yeah. I imagine they watched him every day, but I speci- I'm thinking they probably especially watched him on the Sabbath. Uh, yeah. you know, they were, I've read that there were roughly a thousand laws, mostly negative, mm-hmm. regarding what you couldn't do on the Sabbath. Right. And so I feel like if there was ever a time they thought they could catch Jesus doing something wrong, it would be on the Sabbath. And uh, I read in the commentary that uh, basically it... it what the Pharisees did amounted to theological nitpicking. But in spite of this, you know, Jesus didn't back down. You know, he, he established his authority. He, he didn't let them keep him from doing good. And he didn't let them keep him from fulfilling his mission to bring salvation to all. Yeah. Oh, good. That's, that's a good word. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Andrew, how about you when you're, you've worked through this many hours on it. So I think for me, just the layers that were there that I didn't appreciate after an initial reading. But one of the things that uh, jumps out at me is here's the man with the withered hand. He's, he's obviously in need. And just the fact that when Jesus extended grace, he extended mercy, it was at a cost to himself. So it was free for the withered man, but Mm. eventually we see that the opposition mounts and as mm. a result of this healing, the Pharisees go, they conspire against him, they talk about what they might do to him. So there's this trade there that I think is really um, emblematic of yeah. for us as well. With It's free for us, but yeah. it was very costly for him, the, the grace that we receive as well. Yeah, no, that's good. And, and you know, what stuck with me as I, I was sitting there was um, it was probably something very obvious and clear. And maybe just I've always looked at other aspects of this passage, but just the fact that the law did not override compassion, mm-hmm. uh, that uh, uh, the law uh, and, and be, the legalism aspect of that did not override righteousness or, 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 or virtue. And uh, versus sometimes we talk about the subject of Sabbath and this was a very selfless aspect of what could be done, you know, that the, the law did not override. And it wasn't something selfish. You know, again, it didn't get into uh, Jesus wasn't he, he wasn't performing things or doing things uh, that benefited him necessarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was helping others. And I think about Luke 14, 5, where he's going to get caught again by the Pharisees for healing on a Sabbath. And he this is when he talks about, well, 
you know, if, if you had a son or an ox in a well, yep. wouldn't you go? So same sort of thing. It's uh, wouldn't you do the right thing mm -hmm. uh, at any time? Yeah. And that's kind of what I walked away. I guess the, the saying, you know, there's never a bad time to do the right thing or uh, do good. And, and that mm -hmm. was sort of what what uh, was coming out of that yeah. uh, as well. So, well, good. Well, thank you. And um, all right. So we're, uh, as I mentioned, six verses one through 11. Mike, mm -hmm. would you read that for us today? Sure. <clears throat> Wonderful. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man who was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. The word of the Lord. Mm. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you reading that. And uh, one of the, the, the first part to that passage really is part of the question that we got yesterday from someone after the, the service, Andrew. Very interesting question. And initially I heard it and I thought, oh, this is kind of trivial. And, and the more I thought about it, um, I thought, well, maybe this will be an important uh you know, uh, topic to talk about. And so the question was this, uh, from a cultural context, uh, John was talking about this and, and, uh, he, he was asking in your sermon prep because he had seen this in commentaries. Mm -hmm. Did you come across any further explanation of what the disciples were doing in the field relative to eating the grain? Was this common? Was this perhaps a field owned by the Pharisees uh, in, in making the, the bread of presence uh, for, the, for the, uh, uh, the, 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 the temple, right? Um, was this common? What type of grain? And um, he also said that he came across often that it was actually corn. Okay. So a lot there. Yeah, yeah. There's like kind of an interesting. I mean, yeah. You'll have to refresh me if I miss one of those. <laughs> yeah. Just an interesting part observation. W I guess. Was it corn? I, I think we would be speculating. The Bible doesn't specify. Right. Um, Luke did uh, research very carefully in order to give us an orderly clout, but he does not include that detail. Right. So was it corn like the corn we might see growing in Nebraska? Yeah. I have my doubts. I don't, I don't think so. I, I do know um, in my research, I think it was R.C. Sproul, um, I'm fairly confident, uh, who, who, spe who suggested corn. So I think very highly really? of, of R.C. Sproul. But maybe he was thinking of a different type of corn. Okay. Um, I believe that the King James might use corn in okay. a few instances. But just from my... When huh. I think about Ezekiel 4.9 and, you know, it's just some of the grains and the barleys that they had, I'm... I'm going more that direction. Okay, right, right. Millet, I don't, I don't know, but um, okay, probably not an ear of corn. There's some sort of little piece to the to the grain that you can pluck off and throw in your Get mouth. Get rid of I the guess, husk. Or? I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you familiar with this? I, I'm not a farmer. I, you know, <laughs> are you a farmer? Not, Mike not at the all? son of a farmer or the grandson <laughs> right. of a farmer. I grew up around farms, and I know you know some weeks and then you can you can rub the chaff off and get down to the to the kernel. Okay. Yeah. Use that some sort of nutrition as well, or I would think so. a snack or something. If right. you're okay. hungry, yeah, yeah, anything will do. I can have okay. that experience. From okay. Um, <laughs> so it, I will tell you also, I held a little bit back from the conversation. Okay. So this was interesting. I think he got it what you were saying. So you saw somewhere Archie Sprawl had said 
Yeah, it could have been corn. Mm-hmm. But, but regardless, I think it's because the Greek word actually um, says it can be wheat slash corn as well. Okay. Bedag and, and some of the other ones oh, right. kind of point to that. But um, th- there was also some commentary that spoke of, again, that being the watchful eye of the Pharisees was not only the intent of of keeping an eye on Jesus, but that the fields were actually sort of community property or, again, part of this going into the uh, bread of presence and uh, it Anything on that did you come across? I'm not sure I necessarily I'm making the connection between okay. the bread of presence. That's it, where the wheat came from. That's where the, the, the grain came that they made the bread. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that's why kind of community synagogue fields kind of thing. All right. Or, so, uh, yeah. Okay, a roundabout way to get there. I, yeah. see, I, see, what's, <laughs> I see what's going on now. I am, um, in, in terms of was it common... I, I do recall from the book of Ruth, um, does, does yeah. she not go to the edges when they come back and they're destitute and, they're right. need, and they knew that, hey, we, we could go here. Mm-hmm. They're not going to harvest to the edges. And this is how I can provide right. for Naomi and myself. Right, right. Yeah. And I think there was there was some uh, a few lines of law as well that spoke to what you could and couldn't do in a neighbor's grain field. That you could you could actually take and eat for yourself you couldn't take and sell or you couldn't, you know, harvest it for them, so to speak. But Yeah, sort of like when you're picking strawberries, you know, there's sometimes yeah. a little sign will say that you, you can't taste while you're picking them. But other there I have okay. the strawberry fields growing yeah. up. There was some where you could you could you could enjoy it, but you, you yeah. know, yeah, um, yeah. And d- didn't have to weigh it later. So yeah. maybe it was kind of yeah. along those lines. It was just customary to do that. Interesting. OK, so. um the um, I'm trying to think what else he said here. I wrote down the conversation, the other additional restrictions that the Pharisees imposed on everyday life. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that was the main thing he, that he was talking about uh, with that. So, uh, which I think was interesting too, because the a thousand man-made restrictions. Mm-hmm. What I understood and read was that even amongst those thousand man-made restrictions, that the Pharisees were actually trying to impose. Um, the extent of one beyond what it was intended, that it was actually uh, not a violation of Sabbath, even per their restrictions, to take and eat. Uh, it was a violation of Sabbath to take and sell, to the commerce aspect. So again, but when you, I think the bottom line is when all you have are a thousand, you know, kind of don't do this on Sabbath. Uh, wow, it's hard to keep up with them. You know, I, I can't imagine trying to keep up with all those. Um, but Anyway, I don't know. Any thought on that? You know, guardrails aren't a bad idea. Right. But uh, there's a fine line, I think, between a guardrail that helps us from straying and then just becoming legalistic. Right, right. You know, I don't know if you had a dad that would say, you know, nothing good happens after midnight or something like that. I mean, that kind <laughs> yeah. of a guardrail, you know, yeah. there, there's nothing unholy. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. illegal. There's nothing unethical about being up at yeah. 1 a.m. But it was just kind of a helpful guardrail, you yeah. know. Yeah. And you don't need to be legalistic about it. Yeah. Yeah. Be, if be, that makes sense. Be in by nine is a whole lot better than be in between 854 and 856. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Or you're going to be, yeah, 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 that kind of, that kind of thing, yeah. right? So, so maybe uh, maybe they started out with yeah. good intents, like let's have oh, some sure. guardrails, yeah. so that we really keep the law. Mm-hmm. But it digressed. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, good. Um, historical insight. Each week, again, just a little bit to add. This week, you know, last week we talked about the Pharisees, mm-hmm. and this week we talked about the scribes. Have you ever thought about there being a difference between the two? I was curious to this as well, just in the sermon yeah. prep, because yeah. it says the scribes and the Pharisees. It was only the Pharisees in yeah. the first one, but in the second one, in 6 to 11, that's when it was the scribes and the Pharisees. So I was thinking, all right, what's the difference between the two here? Yeah. And um, it's not really like a, an apples to apples comparison. Right. Because the, the, the scribes were more of a professional class. We could think of them as uh, the lawyers of the day. This was a white collar profession, right? right? These, right. these were the ones that have really studied the law in depth. If you wanted to have a contract executed back in the day, you would have gone to a scribe that would have helped drive. Certainly. They copied down the, the old Testament scriptures. Um, they were kind yeah. of experts in interpreting it. And, mm-hmm. and the Pharisees were uh, and the Sadducees. That was more of a, a of a sect or a stream within right. Judaism. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, do you ever thought about that much, Mike, or? Well, I was thinking if I lived in that historical period and was and had a small group, if we had a question on 
how to interpret a passage yes. of scripture, we would go to a scribe. That's right. Because they were they were the experts. That's right. Yeah, they, they were tasked with that sort mm-hmm. of holding and keeping the yeah. interpretation of the law. And uh, they, I've also seen them uh, really referred to as the uh, sort of the religious attorneys of the day. Uh, the, the, the legal professionals of the day, which they also went into civil and, and community work, but uh, within whether it was uh, the Pharisees or Sadducees mm-hmm. that there could be scribes. Most of them seemed to align with the Pharisees, uh, but they were also called teachers of the law. Mm-hmm. Anytime in Scripture we see that used um, interchangeably as well. Um, I think of Gordon Miller as a scribe. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly, but, um, yeah. you know, so in Gordon that... would probably agree with he that. He probably would, <laughs> yes. <laughs> he was the scribe of all mm-hmm. scribes. Um, in that, I think it is also easy to understand if you're tasked with being the interpreters mm-hmm. and, and the holders of Scripture, you're almost... Um, really being, uh, you know, endorsed as the know-it-alls. Mm-hmm. And now you have someone who has not gone through the schooling and been given those mm-hmm. credentials trying to explain to you and tell you the interpretation. So a lot of tension there. It's, it's like a like maybe a guild. That's not the right word, yeah, perhaps, because yeah. those came about later. But that was yeah. their professional class. Yeah. And it does say, I, I forget the exact chapter and verse, but that Jesus taught as one as with authority, not as the scribes. Oh, yeah. And so you could see why maybe... You know, yeah. well, he's not one of us and he's teaching as one of the, what gives him this right? Yeah. Um, but not all scribes were bad because we know Ezra was right. a scribe. Okay. And he was skilled in understanding the law. And that was a really good thing for the, for the ancient Israelites. I mean, he brought about renewal. Yeah. He brought about uh, a, re, a covenant restoration. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a place too, and I can't recall where it is that it's a teacher of the law, a scribe, not, you know, I think last week we talked about Pharisees and said, look, they're initially, their intent was not bad. Not all of them were as Mm -hmm. bad as we see, Uh, you know, uh, we think about Nicodemus, et cetera. But Mm -hmm. there's also a place in scripture where a scribe or a teacher of the law, uh, Jesus says, what do you think this means? And he told them and he says, well, you're not far off. That's right. You, uh, you, I think you got it. The greatest commandment. Is yeah. that where it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So um, good. I think. Just, and then Jesus goes on to second is like it, you know, so that that's, that's, that's the, where they have that interchange. Yep. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So I think understanding that context and we don't just sort of skim over, you know, oh, Pharisees, mm-hmm. Sadducees, Scribes, they're all the same yeah. thing. Well, no, they, they set up different tension and they set up different dilemmas and responses mm-hmm. based on who and what they were. So yeah. I think that's important to understand. Um, does that make sense? Good history. Yeah. Like, okay. So the scribes. All right. Um, how about our question out of the book this week? Maybe Andrew, you're going to. Sure. Uh, there. So um, how does Jesus use the scripture to demonstrate the intent of the Sabbath, particularly against legalistic observance? What kind of point is Jesus making? Yeah, there? and so the reason we're doing this on Table Talk, Mike, and I don't know if it's helpful for you and Ann or not, but it's, it's maybe just to highlight a question that's it's part of the kind of what was David thinking? You, know, <laughs> was, if you guys are thinking probably much clearer than I am, but um, when I wrote this, and I think the idea here was that we've seen Jesus so far you know, in the wilderness go directly to Scripture right? And his temptations, scripture. Uh, We see it uh, being directly used on the uh, prophetic, you know, the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, He was reading in the temple. This is the first time I think that we've seen it, that he actually recalls scripture. His knowledge of scripture is so great and so useful in order to override legal, you know, the legal observance here, uh, that he's using a whole passage or narrative of scripture. And so I think the encouragement for us is, again, um, to, to learn, live, and, and, and love Scripture. Uh, we, we cannot do wrong the more Scripture we know mm-hmm. in order to respond to any situation, uh, be it uh, temptation, uh, be it just knowledge of who Jesus is, or, or be it in this case, you know, w- what should I do? Or is, is this something I should or shouldn't obey? Or how, how do I respond? And so Jesus uses 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6, and it's at, uh, as you described yesterday, the, 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 the time that David's having to rely mm-hmm. on the bread of presence just to nourish his men, his army. Mm-hmm. 
And so he, that, and, and every time I think about that, I think, wow, that would have seemed like a really, really uh, just uh, huge violation of, of the law at that point. And at some point, um, the priest said, you're right. You know, I, I, it seems like that in Samuel, right? He's certainly not condemned by the biblical writer of 1 Samuel. Nor is he condemned later by uh, the religious leaders, you know, in, in Jesus' mm-hmm. time, right, like you said. And so that, to me, was a much stronger violation of law mm-hmm. than, than picking grain in the field or, or whatever. Yeah. And so, again, I, th- I think it's just the ability to recall um, the the proper interpretation of Scripture, the context of Scripture um, in, in situations is what enables us... Uh, enables us to uh, to be to demonstrate intent uh, and in Sabbath the intent is you know blessing over burden it is compassion over uh, legalism it is uh, doing good over um, law doing godly good mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, over uh, you know the the, the, the restrictions mm-hmm. of man-made laws for certain I don't know. Maybe uh, I'm sure we are, and our groups can probably go 30 minutes on that and, and probably has some much deeper thoughts in that. But anything, Mike, when you hear that question or where you thought maybe you might go Wednesday night or. Well, um, I think that uh, you know, Jesus in the way that he used scripture and certainly in this first story and putting he, he really kind of used it to rebuke him. You know, to yeah. kind of put them in their place, and and I think uh, it was a bit of a stretch for them to try to mm. make the comparison to you know being in the field uh, eating yeah. to to actually doing work and and breaking a law on the Sabbath. So I, uh, Jesus just he, he was amazing, and and yeah. he was prepared. Yeah. And, and and Andrew, what do they say after he tells them about David? Well, they don't. I don't see <laughs> they anything. Don't. <laughs> they don't. Um, Crickets. So, yeah. yeah. And here's what I think is neat too. It, it, we've got 66 books, and there's mm. some history books in there. It's not all just staccato commands like you would find right. in Leviticus per se. And I think what's really interesting here is Jesus goes to narrative. He goes to a yeah. historical account to make his point. And that just shows to me the usefulness of all of Scripture. Yeah. We, you know, okay, just let's just distill it down. Give me the commands. I'll go and do that. And there's something to be said for reading the Old Testament, mm. just the chronological narrative of what happened. And I think the way that the Holy Spirit works for us is there can be times that he can take those events and those incidents, and as we meditate on them, yeah. he can use them to uh, apply those to our life to give us insight as well that will give us wisdom. So you 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 know there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, and it, it seems you know Jesus obviously knew this but he he knew the scriptures but yeah it's I think we can make connections like he just made there yeah when we read it with the help of the Holy Spirit and possibly when we least expect it yeah you know, I'm, I'm sure his disciples never thought that, that as they were walking along that they would be recalling First Samuel tw- you know yeah. <laughs> 21 uh-huh. <laughs> as rebuke and and mm-hmm. uh, really to save their skin so to speak in mm-hmm. that moment yeah um, but um, yeah all scripture is profitable mm-hmm. absolutely yeah well good good that's that's kind of what maybe the conversations can go like on that question mm-hmm. um, kind of move thank you Andrew um, last look at Luke. So this is a, uh, just sort of our last look at Luke. I thought it'd be our last look at Sabbath today. I know, Andrew, I thought it was interesting uh, that I don't know if I've ever heard a Sabbath sermon uh, preached that really didn't talk about whether we should Sabbath or not. And so I thought that was <laughs> There's masterful. There's so many places we yeah. can go. Um, <laughs> well, on so many You don't want to give anyone two for one. You just want to give them one when you're <laughs> up there. That's part two. Yeah, but again, uh, I, like you said, the, the many levels were like, wow, we miss all that when we go straight to yeah. should we Sabbath or not. So, mm-hmm. But in, in that spirit, um, I guess just as a, a closing remark, on Sabbath itself, I, I, I thought— yeah. What, what do we each kind of just think about when we think of Sabbath? Um, yes, no, maybe. Uh, well, I know f- from from myself, just having been raised in the church, we were, I was always taught to respect the Sabbath. And, you know, and 
uh, people that know my wife, Anna, and I know that we raised two grandchildren for a number of years. And uh, while they were with us, uh, they came to River Oaks with us. And they'll tell you that one of the last things that I told them before we walked through the front doors on Sunday was remember where you are. Mm. Uh, because I think, uh, you know, the Bible tells us to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. And I don't interpret that to mean that we need to really have a strict legalistic approach right. or we're sinners. Right. Uh, but I do think that we need to approach it prayerfully mm. and with reverence. Mm. And if God puts something in our path that gives us an opportunity to do good, I think we should embrace it. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Andrew? Absolutely. I think it's his gift to us. And yeah. this is an area of my life where there mm. is a disconnect between mm. what I believe about it and my actions. Uh, hopefully there's instances of growth over the years, mm -hmm. but I do feel that my life would be better off mm -hmm. if I, if, if I was more disciplined in this area. Mm -hmm. it, it's something that I feel more convicted about over the years. So yeah. I feel stronger about it today than I did five, six years ago. I will brag on Pastor David Beatty just for a minute and say he's yeah. incredibly disciplined in this regard, that Thursday is his Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And I can probably count in the 12 years I've been here on one hand the number of times I've seen him in the office on yeah. a Thursday, and it was just because of some really crazy demands that happened. But I think there's something yeah. deeply theological of just saying, I'm not going to work. I'm going to... I'm going to sit, I'm going to enjoy it the way that, um, that God intended because I recognize at the end of the day that I'm not the one that's responsible for keeping the world spinning. God's yeah, doing this yeah. and enjoy it and enjoy him and the things he's given us. Uh, there's so much I could say about that. I, yeah. I, I, do, I do feel convicted on it and want to continue to grow in this regard. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I probably could echo exactly and just have no comment. I, I, it, I will say it's interesting in my life, we've had seasons where uh, we have um, observed a, a pretty strict Sabbath as well, you know, as a young adults, young family. And um, in those days, when I think about it, were, were probably days for which I got more done and was less stressed. <laughs> and, and uh, this new season has been very difficult. And um, again, I, I forget what I know it to be true mm -hmm. that it is a gift and that it should be a blessing and not a burden uh, that, uh, you know, if we're practicing it and something hasn't, a schedule comes up or that's okay. I, I think the Lord understands yeah. that, but it's, it's a matter of trust as it was given. The mm -hmm. Sabbath was originally given as a matter of trust me. Uh, you've worked yep. hard for your own, your own means mm -hmm. for six days. Now trust me on the last one. And so, um, that's what I would pray that we would be able to to uh, to find that, uh, embrace it, uh, and enjoy the rest in Him. Uh, that I we think can we can have another conversation it. just on the yeah, Sabbath, yeah, how to so, do it well, and yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, again, thanks for coming to the table, Mike. Well, thank you, and Andrew. Welcome. We'll see you again. I'm sure at some point in season two three. Weeks. <laughs> in two weeks. Okay. Very good. And thank you for joining us this week at Table Talk. We look forward to seeing you next week as we look at Luke. And may we all find rest. And uh, may we enjoy the blessing and the gift and the trust that we find in Sabbath uh, when we Sabbath in the Lord. Blessings, friends.